Imagine if suddenly no one noticed you existed. That's what happened to this dude after he woke up as a ghost. Now he has to solve what happened to him and try to communicate to others. We start off with a bunch of people at a dinner table outside a house. They're celebrating Nick. His mom is giving a speech and she mentions that Nick's dad is late. Nick stands and leaves the table. He goes to cut a cake which has his face on it, then walks into the house, sits on a stool, and points a pistol at his face. But just before he shoots, he wakes up. It was all a dream. Now he's at breakfast with his mom and that's a funny looking smiley breakfast for a grown man. He asks his mom if she has thought about some writer's course in London that he wants to go for, and it doesn't look like she's in support of it. So he turns a smile on his breakfast into a frown. How cute. And now he's on his way to school on his bicycle. At school, we see him do a business exchange. He did homework for some guy. After handing the homework to the guy, his girlfriend sneaks up on him, asking if he'd be coming for a party tomorrow night, but he says he can't because he'll be busy. Next, we see two guys and a girl trying to get some money from this guy. Apparently, he owes them. The leader of the gang, Annie, threatens him with a knife, but she doesn't really do anything except scratch him on the finger. Now we're in Nick's class and a guy is reading his homework to the class. The teacher asks Nick to top that. He goes to the front of the class, sits on the table, and reads his own work. It's good poetry, but his classmates seem bored out of their minds. So once the bell goes, they all pack their bags and leave. The students are now in the cafeteria. The guy who was scratched is Nick's best friend, Pete. Nick is telling Pete he needs to stand up for himself and not let people push him around. Pete says he can't, so Nick goes to fight for his friend. He goes and pays off Pete's debt and whispers in Annie's ear, you are so broken. Dude really thought he was going to get away with that, but Annie only gave it a few seconds then attacked him, landing some punches on his face. Now two of them are waiting to see the principal and are having a little heart to heart. She tells him he's not better than her because he sells essays. He admits that he's a hypocrite, then the principal comes and sends Annie home. Then he turns to Nick and tells him to stop wasting his time on lost souls like Annie Newton. She has no future. You do. Don't let us down, he says. And Nick's only reply is, can I leave now? Then we see Annie back home. Her stepmother has made her brother dinner so she confronts her about it. This causes an argument between her dad and stepmom but Annie just goes upstairs and makes a sandwich for her brother, Victor. Victor asks her if she'll be going out tonight and she says yes. You can see the boy's mood change. Over at Nick's house, we see Pete arrive and tease him about getting beat up by a girl. Relatable. Pete now asks Nick about that same party and Nick says he won't even be around by tomorrow. He'll be in London for the writer's program. His mom doesn't even know but he's going anyway. According to him, she's always trying to micromanage him and be on top of everything, but he's not going to let her have this one. Now we see Annie get in a car with her boyfriend, Marcus, and they're off to rob a jewelry store. Annie smashes the glass, grabs some jewelry, runs back to the Mercedes which Marcus just stole, and he drives off. The next morning, Annie gets ready for school and is leaving with the bag. Marcus asks her to leave the bag with him, but she refuses and says he'll do nothing about it. But he actually does something. He takes his phone and puts a call through to the police. Oh, what a rat. At school, we see Annie take the bag and put it in her locker. When she closes her locker, she sees Pete giving her a stare down. A few minutes later, the cops show up, open her locker, find the jeweler in the bag, and take her away. She calls Marcus from the station and gives him the update. He asks if she has any idea how they found out, and she says she does, and she'll take care of it. Um, do you really? Anyway, after the call, she leaves the station ready to exert revenge on the person she's so sure ratted her out to the cops. Now we see Pete saying goodbye to Nick. They hug and Nick goes home where his mom has found out about his ticket to London. Apparently, the airline called to say that the time of his flight has been changed. She confronts him about it. He apologizes and said he was trying to talk to her about it. But she notes that he has had the ticket for weeks, so he was going to go no matter what she said. But she's shocked he was just going to leave without saying a word. She says she feels like she has been living with a stranger. Nick is now in his room getting ready to leave. He takes a watch and puts it in his pocket. Then we see Pete walking pretty briskly, and boom! Some guy comes and punches him from nowhere. It's Annie's guys. They take him to Annie. She thinks it's him who ratted her out, so she's beating him up trying to get him to admit to something he didn't do. The torture is too much for him to bear so he says he'll tell her who did it. Boy, who are you about to implicate now? The answer is his best friend, Nick. But well, you just have to understand his rationale. It's not like he's a snake or anything. He just expected that Nick would have left the country by now, and Annie would not have anybody to beat up. But unfortunately for everyone, Nick's flight got delayed. So he's at the party asking his girl if she wants to go to London. While they hang out, he throws her the ticket and tells her to have a good time. It would appear that his mom's little speech changed his mind and he no longer wants to go. And you know, that isn't good news for anybody. He's walking back home when a car starts chasing him and then pushes him to a ditch. It's Annie and her boys. They're beating him up now. Pete comes out of the car and tries to explain his rationale, but nobody's listening to him. Annie now picks Nick up and asks him, who's broken now? And he still answers, you are. We all love a guy with some balls, don't we? Okay, that may have come out wrong. Anyway, Nick's balls are him a few more punches and a hard kick to the face. That kick kills him, so they go and dump his body in a hole. During the process, Nick's watch falls, but nobody notices it. I could forgive Pete before, but not now. How would you allow yourself to be part of that? He's your best friend for crying out loud. Anyway, Annie goes
goes home and confesses to Marcus. She tells him she clapped the guy who sold her out, and you can see the shock on Marcus's face, because he knows for a fact that that was not the person who sold her out. He's now asking her why she came to him. You know I'm on parole, Annie. Why'd you come here? He asks and sends her away. She feels betrayed. Betrayed? Wait till you find out that he's the one who sold you out. She smashes some stuff in his workshop, gives him an ironic kiss, and leaves. Then early the next morning, we see her burning her clothes from last night. You won't believe what we see next. Nick. He walks out of the woods looking unscathed. So clean and fresh. He walks to school, goes and sits in class. But here's the thing. No one can see him. He's, how do you say it? Invisible. Relatable. So nobody knows he's in class, even though he's sitting right there and can hear everything they're saying. They use that opportunity to get a few things off their chest about him, even his girl. She calls him pretentious and says he's always trying to make himself feel important. You can't trust these girls, man. But then again, his best friend also betrayed him. So actually, don't trust anybody, bro. At first, he thinks they're only messing around with him. But then he takes a book, throws it at his shelf. The book never even leaves the table. He then goes to the telephone in the principal's office to call his mom. He's right in his principal's face, but the principal can't see him. This guy must be John Cena. Then he shouts out to his mom. He can hear her talking to the detectives about him, but she can't hear him. He's running home now. On his way, he clatters into someone in the school hallway, gets hit by a car, run over by a truck, but nothing really happens in real life. He gets home and sees detectives all around his house doing everything to find him. He tries to put his mother out of her misery by telling her he's dead, but of course she can't hear him. Now he's just wandering the streets. Man, if I found out I was invisible, I would be doing a lot more than just walking the streets. Anyway, the detectives, Brian and Kate, are making headway with their investigation. They spoke to the principal who told them Nick got in a fight with Annie, so they head to Annie's house. Apparently, Brian knew Annie when she was little because her dad used to be a cop. They're up on the roof asking Annie what she was doing last night, and Nick is there to supervise her lies. But he also finds out that Annie clapped him because she thought he ratted her out. He throws her off the roof, but you know, that just doesn't work. The detectives take a search party out to the woods where Nick's body was dumped, and Annie calls Pete and tells him to be there. Nick hears that and gets visibly sick. He's in his room now and he can see his mom come in and go through his stuff. She's reading a poem he wrote and he's reading along with her. His pet bird joins him in invisible paradise. He holds it in his hands and after some seconds, it disappears. That's a revelation for him. He says, I'm alive. And he runs straight to where his body was dumped. He's trying to get the search party to find him but he's not having much luck with the humans. The dog, however, first seemed like he could see Nick but he turned away at the last second. The dog helped find Nick's watch though. Now Pete is reporting to Annie and the rest of the gang. He feels they'll soon be found out so he says he'll go to report to the police. And he tells him if he reports, he goes to jail too. Meanwhile, Nick is there listening to everything. Annie now sneaks back into her house and she's trying to pack up her stuff and run away. Victor wakes up and asks if she's going to go away and never come back like mom. Oof, that's pretty heartbreaking. Annie is crying now. She might be stone cold, but she's soft when it comes to this boy. She tells Victor to never be like her. Excellent advice. Her dad walks into the room and tells her to leave and she says cool, but if anything happens to her younger brother, she'd be back and she'd clap him. She leaves the house and Nick does one of his monologues again, telling her her horrible family dynamic doesn't excuse anything she has done. The search in the woods intensifies. We can see choppers and ambulances now. A professional says if Nick is alive out there, he has two, three days tops. Now we get a visual of Nick's body and we see his fingers twitch. He's really alive. Detective Brian now goes to have a word with Marcus. He asks him if he was with Annie on Tuesday night and of course he says yes. He then asks him if he was with her the night before when she robbed the jewelry store and he said no. He knows nothing about that. Of course, Brian knows Marcus has been on parole for eight months, but he doesn't stress that too much. He just drops his card and tells Marcus to call him if he sees Annie because he wants to talk to her about a missing person at her school. Finally, Brian makes sure he lets Marcus know that he knows the exact brand of car that got stolen that same night the jewelry store was robbed. Nick is now telling his mom how he knows this won't change a thing for her, because she always has everything under control. He's shouting at her, shaking her, scattering everything on her table, even throwing a chair through the window. But of course, none of that actually happens. A few moments later, his mom breaks down and starts crying. She's really weeping and calling out Nick's name. Pete is taking a walk under the rain when Marcus comes from nowhere, grabs him, and points a gun at his chest. Marcus tells Pete that he's being followed by the police, and he actually is. He takes him into the woods and Pete points to him where the body was dumped. The next day, Marcus tries to trick Annie to come to a location so he can clap her, but she suspects something, so she calls Pete and tells him to go instead. Pete goes and is followed by Detective Kate, after Nick did his best to get her to wake up and look. Pete is now at the bridge with the two guys while Annie is watching from a distance, but then Marcus comes from behind her and points a gun at her back. He takes her to the bridge where the rest of the guys are and tells Pete to go home. He runs home. You can see how thankful he was that he was asked to go. Marcus says they have to move quickly because there's a tail on Pete, and he's right, but it's too late now. The cops are already here. Annie then grabs a shotgun from Marcus and is pointing it at the cops 
but they're surrounded now. But Annie is one hell of a survivor. She manages to climb out and escape. Peter Parker would be extremely proud. While she's running away, Nick screams, they'll catch you, Annie. And it seems like she heard him, because she turns around and yells something. So Nick goes, she heard me. She goes to a club and sells a ring which belonged to Marcus to some guy. After he pays her, she decides to stay back and do a little dancing. She takes off her hoodie and beanie, and is now doing the signature white woman dance while Nick is just watching her. The next day, she goes to her mother's grave, and she says she's sorry. Then Nick starts talking about how sometimes he wishes his mom died, instead of his dad, because of how much pressure she puts on him. He now reaches out to Annie and touches her shoulder. He says he knows she can hear him, so he tells her just to tell them where his body is, but she just stands up and leaves. He follows her. She breaks into the school at night and puts some money in an envelope for Victor, and puts it in her locker. Nick is there to tell her he's dying, and he doesn't have much time left, and ironically, she's the only one who can save his life. You can tell she can hear his voice in her head, so he screams her name and she turns around, but she can't see anybody. She's miserable now. She goes to take a shower, and being a good boy, Nick makes sure not to look. Meanwhile, Nick, the one in the hole that is, opened his eyes at this point. Annie is sleeping now in the basketball court, and Nick is right beside her, running his hands through her body and calling out her name. He oversleeps and is woken up by the basketball team that comes in for practice. How are you a ghost and oversleeping? Or sleeping at all, for that matter. Anyway, now we see Annie in Nick's house. She's growing through his old photos and getting nostalgic. Do not tell me these two are falling in love, because even Nick is out here smiling while his body's decaying in that hole. Thankfully, Nick's mom comes in and kills whatever romance was brewing. Annie runs out of the house and straight into the woods to where they dump Nick's body. And Viola, the body isn't there. Nick is telling Annie that someone was there to move his body and he's asking her to think. She sees the substances that she found with Pete days back and that tells her that Pete was here. So she goes after Pete at school. Pete is now telling her that Nick didn't even rat her out in the first place. He then confesses that he and Marcus moved the body. So she goes after Marcus. She ambushes him in his car, just outside a police station. Then she takes him to a precipice and tells him to go on his knees. Roll reversal moment. Then she points a gun at him. Meanwhile, Pete is trying to self-delete. Nick is begging him not to do it, but Pete can't even hear a thing. But here's the beautiful thing. While Pete is in that transition zone where he's not dead yet, but not fully alive, he sees Nick. They can see and talk to each other. Nick is now asking Pete where he moved the body to at the same time Annie is asking Marcus the same question. They both answer about the same time. After they do, Pete's parents rush into his room and find him in the state he's in. And Annie just leaves Marcus and turns around to go find Nick. But not clapping him turns out to be not a very very good idea, because Marcus stands up and shoots her. She doesn't die, though. She has enough in her to shoot him and stand up and call Detective Bryant. She tells him where Nick is and tells him she left something for her brother in her locker, and he should make sure Victor gets it. The cops rush off to the dam where Nick's body is, but of course, Nick gets there before them. He finds his body and he's now touching himself. Oh no, not in that way. He's with his body now, but you know, he can't save himself. The dam gates open and Nick is drowning. Kate calls for the gates to be closed and now the cops are looking for Nick. Brian finds him and they all rush there. Indeed, he's alive. They rush him into the ambulance and Annie is there watching from a very far distance. She's still bleeding. She gets into her car and sort of blacks out for some time. She's woken up later in the evening by a cop who asks her to come down from the car, but she doesn't and just drives away instead. As expected, they start chasing her. At the hospital, Nick's mom is watching as the doctors try to save her son. The police finally surround Annie and they all have guns pointed at her, but she hears Nick's voice in her head saying, I need you, Annie. I need you. And that was all the fuel she needed. She steps on the accelerator and drives through the police blockade. She gets to some place, dumps the car, and completes her journey on foot. Where does she go? The hospital, of course. Nick directs her to where his body is being operated on. She gets there and Nick's mom goes, You have some nerve. The moment she sees her, Nick tries to play peacemaker, but, you know, mama can't hear you. So Annie has to do it all on her own. She says she just has to talk to Nick, but Nick's mom lands a slap on her face. Annie then tells her that Nick is here, that she can feel him and hear him, that she knows what he wants. Of course, she doesn't believe her. So on Nick's directive, Annie tells Nick's mom about that time she was in his room reading his poems and how he was with her then. She now asks Annie what she wants, and Annie says she just needs to see Nick. She can help him, but his mom says no. Annie hands her her gun and says she knows she can bring him back. She finally lets her go in. Annie is now running her fingers through Nick's body. She apologizes to him and begs him not to go. She takes off her necklace, which once belonged to her mom, and puts it in his hand while she joins him on the bed and snuggles with him. When she does that, the invisible Nick disappears, and the real Nick wakes up and calls Annie's name. Annie says she wanted to do one good thing, and Nick tells her she did. She saved him. Then, Annie taps out. Then, we see Victor playing with a toy plane, and Nick shows up and has a conversation with him. Victor says his sister died, and Nick says they should send her a message. Victor's message is simple and short. Hey, Annie. So, Nick writes that on the plane for him, and they fly it. Moral of the story? I don't know, but that was sad.